The genus Neisseria causes two main infections in humans. And this genus is particularly interesting because it is a gram-negative coccus-shaped organism. This is the first gram-negative coccus we've talked about and is likely one of the only gram-negative coccus that you will see in a clinical setting. So the fact that it's gram-negative and it grows as this type of diplococcus is a really key feature for this bacterium. These species belonging to this genus are generally oxidase positive um, and catalase positive. Oxidase is a really easy biochemical test. It literally takes like 30 seconds to a minute to do that test. You are looking for that presence of cytochrome C and I'll show you what the test result looks like in just a second. And of course, we've already talked about catalase um, a number of different times. The two species in this genus that are the major causes of infection are Neisseria meningitidis, which grows on regular blood auger, and Neisseria gonorrhea, which grows on the enriched chocolate auger. So remember, chocolate auger is a type of blood auger that's been heated, which helps to release some of the factors in the blood that are helpful for bacterial growth. Here, we're looking at biochemical results from Neisseria meningitidis, both oxidase and catalase. And remember, I think you should look up the oxidase test and remind yourself what it's looking for and think of what other, especially gram-negative bacteria have we talked about that are oxidase positive and oxidase negative. The first member of the Neisseria genus that we'll talk about is Neisseria gonorrhea, which is the causative agent of the sexually transmitted infection gonorrhea. There are a number of different virulence factors that this bacterium possesses that allow it to cause disease. I always think that adhesion is really important, so Neisseria gonorrhea can use a pillin protein for initial attachment to non-ciliated human cells. There are a lot of places it can bind. So the epithelium, fallopian tube, buccal cavity. This protein also helps interfere with killing by neutrophils. They have um, a protein called OPA, which helps mediate even better attachment. They have immune evasion in the form of preventing phagolysosome fusion um, and hiding their surface antigens. They have proteins that allow them to acquire iron. Their LPS is actually not LPS, it's LOS. The polysaccharide is shorter, so it's lipooligosaccharide, which does act like an endotoxin. Uh, it can destroy um, IgA and it can break down penicillin. So this is a pretty nasty pathogen. And again, one of the highlights here is the fact that it has LOS instead of LPS. This is the second most common notifiable disease in the US. We'll talk about the first later, but it's also a sexually transmitted infection. There were over 675,000 reported cases in 2020, which is up from 2019. And it's estimated that there are over 100 million cases per year worldwide. The highest rates of infection are in ethnic and racial minorities. This is specifically in the US uh, and also in the southeastern portion of the country. And on the next slide, I'm going to show you a map of the US at the county level. And you can kind of see those areas where infection rates are really high. Women have a 50% risk of acquiring infection from a sexual encounter with an infected partner. Men have about a 20% risk of acquiring the infection. And asymptomatic carriers are the biggest transmitters. Generally, and we'll talk about the symptoms in just a minute, but generally when a patient is experiencing symptoms, they will go seek treatment. The symptoms are um, 
rather noticeable. So when patients don't have symptoms, they don't seek treatment, and that's how you get uh, additional transmission. Here, as promised, the county map of the United States, and you can see that in the southeast, particularly places uh, like Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, South Carolina, we have relatively high rates of infection. Also, Fresno County right here. Oh, my arrow needs to be just a smidge higher, but here's Fresno County. Uh, again, we have one of the higher incidence rates in the county. In terms of symptoms in men, the infection is generally going to be restricted to the urethra. Uh, there will be a discharge and painful urination. That generally will lead men to seek treatment. However, if not, it can lead to further complications, including um, infection in the epididymis and also even in the prostate. Women tend to experience infection in the cervix, which can lead to discharge, painful urination, and abdominal pain. This infection can ascend the reproductive tract, so you may remember from the previous slide that it can bind to the fallopian tubes and it can cause a manifestation of disease called pelvic inflammatory disease. So 10 to 20% of patients could develop this pelvic inflammatory disease. And that can lead to uh, scarring in the fallopian tubes and that can cause permanent infertility. Infrequently, one to 3% of women and even fewer men the bacterium can leave the reproductive tract or oral cavity wherever it's been um, causing its first infection and can cause septicemia, so it can get into the bloodstream, and it can also cause joint infection. Um, and in fact, it's the leading cause of purulent arthritis in adults, so arthritis that's not just inflammatory, but arthritis that's caused by infection. Uh, newborns can have ocular complications, so as the child is passing through the vaginal canal, if it encounters the bacterium, you can have an ocular infection. The bacterium can also cause anorectal infections and pharyngitis. Wherever the bacterium gets, that's probably where it will cause infection. So arthritis, it says it's a common presentation. Um, this was back in 1973. So it's less common now because more people are willing to seek treatment, which is great. There's a lot less stigma surrounding that. Uh, so this uh, paper describes six patients with the disease, including the following patient who has a very typical case of infection. 17-year-old girl admitted to the hospital, four-day history of fever, chills, tired, sore throat, skin rash, and pain in multiple joints. She is sexually active. She had a five-week history of yellowish vaginal discharge that was left untreated. Upon presentation, she had a red rash on her forearm, thigh, ankle, um, in the hand joints, wrist, knee, ankle, all sorts of inflammation. She had an elevated white blood cell count. Cultures of the cervix were positive for gonorrhea but blood specimens, exudate from the skin lesions, and synovial fluid were all sterile. The diagnosis of disseminated gonorrhea with polyarthritis was made and she was successfully treated with penicillin G for two weeks. This case illustrates the limitation of culture in disseminated infections and the value of a careful history. So it's entirely possible that the levels of bacteria that disseminate are relatively low, but you still get all of those symptoms, even if you don't have a massive culturable infection. And this is why uh, it's really important to try to get an accurate history. Uh, those of you who may find yourself working in perhaps as an OBGYN or in some sort of clinic where people might present with sexually transmitted infections, especially when you're talking about juveniles, it really is important to get an accurate history. And that may involve some awkward conversations, getting parents out of the room so the child will feel more comfortable to disclose what's really going on. So gonorrhea can be diagnosed through gram stain of the discharge, uh, through nucleic acid tests, and of course it can be cultured. Generally, uh, we're looking at antibiotic therapy with ceftriaxone and then a combination therapy. 
and we are seeing increasing antibiotic resistance, as I mentioned previously, and I'm going to talk about in just a minute. There is no vaccine available. So I want you to reflect on why, and I'll give you a hint. Go back and look at some of the virulence factors, especially those that help with immune evasion and see why it might be difficult to generate a vaccine against this bacterium. And so if we talk about antibiotic resistance, drug resistant Neisseria gonorrhea is considered to be an urgent threat by the CDC. It's estimated that there will be over half a million drug resistant infections per year. Um, and this number is even higher than the previous from the CDC, 1.14 million total infections per year. So this is the estimate. And there were about 675 million that were actually diagnosed. So they're, they're estimating that there are nearly twice as many people running around with gonorrhea than, than we think because a lot of them are asymptomatic. And then if you look at lifetime direct medical costs, 133 million. So it causes um, a lot of issues. And the other thing I kind of want you to think about as you're doing your reflection is, so this is a sexually transmitted infection. And right here it tells you that really, you know, the major life-threatening issue would be in a patient who had fallopian tube scarring, this could potentially lead to ectopic pregnancy, um, which could be life-threatening, but is a rare complication. And also the risk of um, HIV infection is higher in patients who have chronic gonorrhea. But why would an infection that is almost never, almost never life-threatening, why would that be considered an urgent threat compared to something like Staph aureus, which was not considered an urgent threat, but is life-threatening far more commonly. So, you know, think about that. Like, why? Why is this urgent? And then I just thought this headline was interesting. Is anyone clapping for super gonorrhea? And that's kind of what we're looking at right now. Because the infection is so common, and is so commonly treated with antibiotics, we are seeing higher levels of antibiotic resistance.